Welcome everybody again. So again, thank you for your patience. My name is Jerry Hush. I work with Maria. Um, my role is as a, a coordinator for the USDA Farsan Farmers Ranch Stress Assistance Network. And so I've been helping Maria with this food systems work. And today we're very, very pleased to have Jennifer Folk and um, Emily join us, Emily Ernest, and they will introduce themselves given their, and give their background. Those of you who have joined us before know that this is uh, our food systems uh, speaker series. And the goal of this uh, set of series is that we can really better understand not only the particular characteristics of each um, aspect of the food system, but also understand how uh, we can strengthen that food system between Maryland and Delaware, and certainly how you can become more involved. We've been using this visual as a way to present the complexities of the food system, and each particular area has been discussed with our experts. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the implications of climate change on the system as a whole. And again, we want to thank our various supporters. This has been a, um, allowed us to work across a number of stakeholders. So thank you, all, all of you who have been involved. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jennifer and Emily, and they are going to be helping us understand whether climate change and how it will uh, impact our regional food system. So I'm going to turn over the visual to um, Jen. So again, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jerry. So again, <laughs> hello everyone. I'm happy to be here today. My name is Jennifer Volk. I am an environmental quality specialist with the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension. And I'm Emily Ernest. I'm a scientist with the Extension Vegetable and Fruit Program. And uh, we also want to acknowledge two other colleagues of ours, uh, Dr. Jared Miller, he's our extension agronomist, and Dr. Amy Schober, our nutrient management specialist. Further on in the presentation, I'll be showing you a couple of slides of some of the, the work that they're doing with respect to climate change. So you have already seen this socio-ecological model that Jerry had uh, shown you, and I know if you've been uh, attending these webinars, this has been a common theme for them. Um, and today we're here to talk about climate change. And in this particular diagram, climate change is linked to land. It's in this environmental bubble of this food system. And it's a very appropriate place for it to be. And as Emily and I go through what some of the impacts of climate change are on our food system, it's very clear that climate change has an impact on our land. I will also argue though that uh, with all of these linkages moving between the different parts, climate change impacts our water, our energy usage, our ability to store and transport food. So it's hitting all of these other um, parts of this system. And it also impacts our consumers, where they live and what their uh, food uh, preferences are and, and what they demand from uh, the food system. So before we dive into those things, I wanted to first kind of take a step back and look at how we know climate is, is changing. And I like to show this particular chart. Um, I update it every time I give a presentation. Sadly, the numbers are always going up. So here we're showing the CO2 concentrations over time in parts per million. And this is measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. So this uh, particular station was started back in the 1950s. The first paper, or one of the first papers on climate change was the publication of this data in 1965. So we have a very long record looking at CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And you can see the trend is upward. So you may say, oh, that's only going back to the 1960s. How do we know it's really you know, a high number compared to um, the, the age of the earth? And so we can go and look at ice uh, cores you can, uh, scientists have determined that you can um, infer the CO2 concentration that was in the atmosphere at the time ice froze in the past. So they'll take ice cores and look at the, the CO2 frozen in the gas or CO2 gas frozen in those cores. And so you can see from this much longer record that goes back 800,000 years that the highest CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has been 300 parts per million. We're now well over 100 parts per million more than that. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, they have said that they have um, a 95% probability that the recent increase that we're seeing is due to the human production of greenhouse gases, our use of fossil fuels primarily. And that really started to um, 
that that trend got going in the, the 1750s, which was the start of the Industrial Revolution. So in addition to knowing and measuring that we have higher CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, we also have measured that our temperatures have warmed. We've taken that the global temperature of our planet and we have seen that, um, and it's documented that it's increased between 1.4 to 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit from those pre-industrial levels. Um, we've also documented warmer water. We've seen that our frozen water on the planet has been melting, those ice sheets, sea ice, glaciers. And when you have uh, that bright reflective surface of snow and ice melt away and reveal land beneath it, that's actually now, instead of going to uh, absorb the energy and the heat and that sunlight that's coming in rather than reflect it away. And so that causes a further warming. Those dark surfaces absorb that energy and causes the planet to continue warming. So it's a feedback loop that we have there. In addition to having water melt off the land and enter the oceans, resulting in sea level rise, because the air and the water are warmer, molecules actually take up more space. They're bigger, and so that causes the actual volume of the ocean to expand, which contributes to sea level rise as well. There's been documentation of more free, uh, frequent and extreme uh, weather events, which has cost more and more money over the years, and documentation of the acidification of the ocean. So more um, hydrogen is dissolved in the ocean, which has significant consequences for coral reefs and other marine life. So that's on a global scale. Let's bring it more regional and talk about some Delaware data. And I, I know we have folks from Maryland on as well. Uh, I'm sure your state has similar information. This is coming from our state climatologist, Dr. Daniel Leathers. And he has documented from um, our many weather stations in Delaware uh, going back before 1900 that our annual average uh, temperature for the state taken from the average of all of our weather stations across the state has increased by more than two degrees over the last century. He's also looked at the changes in our precipitation. Um, we're a wet area. We have a lot of rain compared to other parts of our country. Uh, if you look at an annual average basis, there's no statistically significant trend in our precipitation. But if you break that down and look at seasons, there is an increase in precipitation during the fall months where it's getting wetter. And then finally, if you look at um, this uh, tide chart, which was uh, published in this Delaware Sea Level Rise Advisory Council, but it's NOAA data, we have tide gauges off our coast, again, going back to the early 1900s, and we have documented that our seas are rising. In Delaware, they've risen by more than a foot in the last century. We're one of the, the states with the fastest rising sea levels, um, and that's because we're also technically sinking geologically. So that's what we have seen and documented in the past. What can we expect for the future? And so there was a report from the IPCC in 2018 that said that it's very likely that we will see an, ad an additional increase in our global annual average temperature of 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.5 degrees C. Um, and so that will happen between 2030 and 2052. You can see here, I've included the quotes and they say high confidence. So the IPCC is using multiple models. They're, they're not relying on one climate model. They're looking at dozens of them and they're looking for uh, consistency with the results, with the outputs. And so if they find with all of these models that have different uh, unique qualities to them, that if they're coming up with similar predictions, they have high confidence versus if they came up with a variety of predictions, they would have lower confidence. So they have very high confidence that we're going to see an additional warming going into the future. And that's the near term, 2032 to 2052. And they said they also have high confidence that even if we control that increasing temperature to another 1.5 degrees C, our seas will continue to rise beyond 2100, so looking out further. And that's again because of these feedback loops. The climate is, every part of our climate system is connected, and the warming that has happened in the atmosphere is going to continue to produce rising seas because of that melting ice. So um, it's not something that will uh, be reversed very quickly either. It took time to get us to this point. It's going to take time to recover from it as well. So again, that's globally. If we take it to our region, um, a report was done uh, by our Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control to downscale those global climate models and look at Delaware and calibrate and validate it to our local Delaware data. And they came up with similar predictions. 
it's going to get warmer. We're going to have increases in our annual and our seasonal temperatures. Um, summer will be uh, warming more than the winter. Um, and then we'll see more of those extreme events. Extreme heat days and heat waves will be more frequent with the extreme cold days less frequent. Similarly, um, while our trends, our, our uh, past precipitation data has shown no statistically significant trend except for in the fall, the modeling effort that they did said it looks like it will be wetter. The confidence in that is not as great as it was for the, the temperature predictions, but it looks like it's also going to be uh, wetter during those winter months, which we're going to be talking about agriculture. That's not when crops are typically using water. Um, it's not when we're going to be storing it in um, our, our, our vegetation. That's when we'll have more runoff um, and possibly flooding. So in addition, there will be uh, more intense precipitation as well. So where it's coming down hard and fast, again, uh, likelihood of causing some flooding problems. A separate report was done uh, by another group um, coordinated by the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control that looked at sea level rise. And they have predicted that there's a 98% probability that sea levels will rise by an additional foot by 2100 and an 87% probability that it will rise by two feet. So very likely it's going to get warmer, wetter, higher seas on, on our Delaware coasts. So what does that mean for our food system? Again, I'll start at the global level. I know, again, we're a regional group, but uh, our food system is um, something that's connected across the planet. So this more recent report from the IPCC came out in February, and they said that in this near-term period, so looking from now until 2040, that an increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade in our annual average temperature is going to cause unavoidable increases in multiple climate hazards and present multiple risks to ecosystems and humans. Again, high confidence there. They also had high confidence that if you look beyond 2040, out to the end of the century, 2100, that um, our changing climate is going to lead to numerous risks for, again, natural and human systems. Here's where they point out um, specifically food production. Climate change will increasingly put pressure on food production and access, especially in vulnerable regions, undermining food security and nutrition. So they have this great chart here. Um, it's broken out by these three um, aspects of human systems. Impacts on water scarcity and food production is this first kind of set of um, the first set of columns. Impacts on health and well-being is the second set, and I'll point out this is where they talk about malnutrition. Um, and the third set is impacts on cities, settlements, and infrastructure. And our infrastructure is how we move food around, how we get it to and from people. So um, it breaks it out, uh, has global at the top as well as each region. So here we are in North America. And just to quickly describe all of these dots, if the dot is blue, that means they have high confidence uh, in that risk. Purple is medium confidence, gray is low confidence, or empty is insufficient data. And then inside of each dot is either a minus sign, which means the impact would be negative, it would be adverse to that particular um, uh, characteristic. Or if it has a plus and minus sign, it means that it could be positive and negative impacts. So again, if we come here and we look at North America and across this line here, it's mostly uh, negative uh, impacts that have high confidence. But if we specifically go and look here at the agriculture and crop production, you can see it's a plus and minus. There are some pluses here. So it's not all doom and gloom. So next we're going to go and break this down and get to uh, look more closely at Delaware. And uh, a lot of the uh, information that's on these uh, following slides has come from this uh, climate impact assessment report that Denmark put out in 2014. So if you're interested in looking at that, you can go through and, and read the, um, the various chapters. And there's five chapters on the impacts on agriculture, water resources, ecosystems and wildlife, infrastructure, and public health. And so it's at this time, I'm going to turn things over to Emily. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to talk some about the more specific impacts that we are seeing and anticipate, especially in this region. So Jen talked about uh, anticipated temperature increases, and there are a lot of potential impacts of increasing temperatures. One of them uh, really impacts our perennial fruit crops, and that is warmer winter weather can won't, doesn't provide the cool temperatures that are needed 
for uh, bud production and for the plants to go through the required chilling period. And then um, some plants will come out of dormancy uh, too early in the spring before the risk of frost and freeze damage has passed. This is something that we have, of course, observed in the past, I would say fairly infrequently, but seems to be becoming more and more frequent. Um, any of you who are involved in agriculture may have noticed and experienced some of the unseasonably late freezes that we had uh, this past year and also in 2020. Um, and there is some evidence that that, that is due to um, instability in the jet stream that's really from uh, the global system and global climate change. The, then um, more during the warmer parts of the season, high temperatures impact pollen viability. I have done research on this in lima bean, but it's common across crops. Um, it's a problem in corn, in small grains, in many legume crops, and also fruiting vegetables. So any crops where we are trying to produce seeds um, or fruit, pollination is an important part of the equation and high night temperatures especially impact pollen. And then warmer temperatures can cause plants to to grow faster. And there's also some indication that there's some impact of higher CO2 levels themselves, making plants uh, create more carbohydrates and um, less proteins. So um, this is an impact on crop quality and also potentially on yield. There are some potential advantages for growing some crops with a longer growing season. However, we're still um, experiencing, at least in the spring, late freezes that really prevent us from taking advantage of warmer spring conditions. Those warmer spring conditions are, are really more of a detriment, especially with perennial crops like fruit. Um, and of course, on a more ecosystem level, we have wild plants that are changing their um, growth, their range. Um, some of them become invasive weeds. Um, and the, the plants and the animals that depend on them don't always uh, change their migration in the same, at the same time, leading to habitat fragmentation. So I mentioned um, the potential for increased uh, pest pressure from weeds, insects, and diseases. When plants are, when our crops are stressed because um, we have growing conditions that are not optimal, they're more susceptible to pests and diseases. Certain pests and diseases are going to be, um, uh, have an advantage in a warmer and uh, wetter climate. Um, one of the diseases that we are really seeing problems with in vegetable crops is Phytophthora capsici, which is a fungal-like pathogen that's soil-borne. It lives in free water and it affects many crops from watermelons and cucumbers to lima beans and snap beans, has a very wide host range and um, is an increasing problem because of having fields with waterlogged soils more frequently. So I was alluding to some of the precipitation. Um, we have issues uh, with flooding and uh, Phytophthora capsaicea isn't a fungus, but it's a fungal-like organism. Um, had a lot more um, situations where we have ponding in fields that leads to drown out spots that will not be productive uh, crop-wise and become places where lots of weeds grow. 
during the summer. And um, drought stress is another potential impact in areas with sandy soil. Um, we really need frequent rain or irrigation. Many acres in Delaware are uh, irrigated, and right now we have um, adequate groundwater supply. So irrigation is one of the risk mitigation tactics that we are using already um, as a part of our agricultural system to deal with potential impacts of climate change. And of course, drought stress exacerbates heat stress for plants um, because the way that plants cool themselves is by um, transpiring water vapor from their leaves and under drought stress, they close their stomates and then they can't uh, cool themselves any longer and that leads to heat stress. Jen mentioned um, the potential for more precipitation in the winter and that coming more as rain, that is then as snow, um, that can impact whether the water ends up in the ground or running off where it won't be useful, which of course um, also creates issues from a nutrient pollution standpoint. Um, and then with more intense thunderstorms, we can get damage from wind and hail. From, for sea level rise, we are already seeing impacts um, from salinization of soils that had been in agriculture, but have now been impacted by saltwater intrusion. And of course, we have a lot of poultry production in this region, and then um, some other animal agriculture. Animals are also uh, impacted by rising temperatures, especially. Um, uh, heat stressed animals do not grow well, it reduces milk production and dairy animals, and animals under stress are more susceptible to disease. For the poultry industry especially, um, it's going to increase the energy consumption, especially for cooling of those poultry houses. Um, electricity is a major expense for poultry producers and um, the expense for cooling is likely to increase with increasing temperatures. Also, there can be uh, damage and all the crops that we grow to feed livestock can be impacted in the ways that I've just mentioned, talking about impacts on crops. And with extreme weather events, we have risk for damage to the infrastructure, the buildings that we use for um, animal production. And um, in some areas, we're seeing flooding where um, flooding hadn't occurred in the past. So the impact site selection areas that may have been good, good sites for animal production in the past can become poor sites. So just to summarize, we have increasing temperatures, all these changes to precipitation patterns, and they all impact our ability to produce food in this region and worldwide we have um, the potential for more extreme weather events um, that affect all sorts of processes in our food system from transportation to production and um, rising seas changing where people live, changing preferences related to climate change. Jen already sort of alluded to that. And um, maybe people are changing their preferences as far as wanting products that are local and sustainable. Thanks, Emily. So, um, you know, that's a lot of information about the impacts, but what, what does that mean? And uh, how much control do we have over managing those impacts? 
And there are things that we can do to both mitigate and adapt to them. Um, mitigation strategies, uh, back when I first started working in this area, I really wasn't so sure about the difference between mit mitigation and adaptation. Um, but really mitigations are the things that you do to reduce the magnitude of climate change itself. So you're reducing those emissions by becoming more energy efficient or using um, alternative sources that are not emitting greenhouse gases, or you're offsetting those emissions, which are where you're doing anything you can to really um, take that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it in our plants, um, like our trees especially, and managing it in our soils. So our agriculture, our um, forested areas, wetlands, and even urban green spaces, we refer to them as our natural and working lands. These are really an important and critical um, part of our strategy for addressing climate change. If you do not protect these existing sinks, then you're going to not only release that CO2 back into the atmosphere, but you're going to lose the ability to sequester and store carbon dioxide over a longer term period. So you can see just from this um, diagram here, there's many opportunities for uh, mitigating CO2, taking it, sequestering it from the atmosphere through trees, as well as through our soil management practices, um, where we can really start to store and build up our, our carbon matter in the soils. And so adaptations differ. Adaptations are where you're saying, I'm accepting that climate is changing. I wanna make myself um, as, um, as resilient as possible and reduce my vulnerability to the changes that are coming. And so there's a number of strategies we can take to, um, to do that. So the US Department of Agriculture actually has an adaptation resource. It is basically a menu of options and it's a, a toolkit that you can walk through and look at what type of adaptations would be helpful to you. So the, the first strategy that they present is to sustain the fundamental functions of soil and water. So this is where you're gonna do whatever you can to uh, maintain and improve your soil health. So you might be doing things like uh, conservation tillage practices and using cover crops where you're going to keep the soil there on the crop field and not let it erode away through water and wind. Um, and those practices are actually also good for improving water quality. Um, they capture the nutrients and decrease the sediment that's getting into our local waterways. The second strategy they present are reducing the existing stressors to crops and livestock. So the impacts that Emily talked about with the pests, the weeds, the diseases, the, um, the insects, if you can reduce those stressors, which are added on to the temperature, you're going to make yourself more resilient. The third strategy is to reduce the risks from the warmer and drier conditions. So we have managed the other stressors. What can we do to, uh, now that we, we know it's warmer and drier? And so this might be changing how you are actually managing your, your agricultural operation. That might be changing the timing of your planting or when you fertilize or how your grazing strategy if you have livestock. And you might here start to consider using different types of more tolerant varieties um, of plants and animals. The fourth strategy is reducing the risk and long-term impacts of extreme weather. So again, a lot of the same practices that you would do to uh, sustain your fundamental functions can probably also reduce your extreme impacts from flooding and um, extreme winds. The fifth strategy is managing your farms and fields as part of a larger landscape. And so here you would consider buffer areas, adjacent properties? Do you have a source of, um, or do you have a location for pollinator habitat? Thinking about your, um, your natural and working land as part of a larger landscape. And then the six strategies to look at um, how you might alter your management to accommodate those expected future conditions. And so here you might consider diversifying your operation. Um, and really that's where you may start to select new species to use. Um, that would be able to tolerate those conditions that we're expecting in the future of being warmer and um, possibly drier in the summer with more rain in the winter. The seventh strategy is altering your systems um, and your land for those new climate conditions. So again, you might convert part of your operation to do something else or use those lands differently. You might migrate your operation, which is easier said than done, but you know, move, move where you're farming. Um, or you might retire some lands into conservation practices if they're underproductive 
or um, you severely degraded by the changing climate. And finally, the eighth strategy that they present in this workbook is to alter your infrastructure to match your new and expected conditions. So Emily mentioned irrigation. Do you have a well? Do you have the irrigation equipment? Could you in add that infrastructure? Do you need to shore up your buildings to manage, um, to, to withstand extreme weather events? This is also uh, a strategy where they suggest you look at technology. Do you need to invest in new equipment and machinery? Do you, um, have you considered using precision agriculture, which is a great segue into some of the work that our colleagues, Amy and Jared are doing. So the, they're looking at precision technology. Jared is our precision ag guy, and he's been looking at precision ag for a number of reasons, not just climate change, but it has climate change added um, applications as well. So he's used um, a number of uh, types of equipment that can either attach to or get pulled behind the farm machinery that's driving across the landscape. He also uses drones where he gets an aerial view and they have sensors on them that can look at the vegetation and, um, and as well as the soils and get a sense for um, what's happening there. And so these um, uh, sensors that they have on this equipment, it can measure the, the pH, the electrical conductivity, and the organic matter. Um, and they'll use that information together with the, the drone imagery of how the, the vegetation is responding. And with a climate change adaptation, they can go and look to see where there's salt on the fields that are uh, these coastal fields that are experiencing saltwater overwash from extreme storm events. So we're a coastal state. We live in a coastal region with the Chesapeake Bay. We have a number of fields that are experiencing this condition where salt water is coming up out of tidal ditches and then onto the fields. And so they can use this technology to go and look at the places that are maybe beyond um, help that they would maybe retire that area from agriculture because the salt is so high there, but then find other areas where they could manage those soils differently. And one technique that they're looking at is applying gypsum to the soil which basically has the effect of pushing the salt out of the soil. It, it, it um, changes the chemical nature of it so that the, the salt leaches away. And so this is a strategy to help coastal farmers maintain the productivity of their, uh, their fields that are being salt impacted. But they would only use that technique using a variable rate spreader on the areas where it's needed. So they wouldn't just broadcast gypsum out at the same level everywhere on a field. They would only apply it to the places where it's gonna have an impact and make that uh, those soils productive again. So that's one example. Emily's gonna take us through a couple more. Okay, so I have done some work along with my colleague, Gordon Johnson, um, looking at various ways to adapt vegetable and fruit production to climate change. One thing that gets mentioned a lot is to use more stress tolerant crops or more stress tolerant varieties of the crops that we are already growing. I wanted to talk a little bit about what it takes to get more stress tolerant crops. And the stresses that I'm talking about are generally abiotic stresses. Many breeders are already trying to develop crops that are resistant to diseases. Um, and that's already a part of their breeding program. Um, and also, in some cases, insect resistance. Stress tolerance, I'm talking about drought tolerance, heat tolerance, and even tolerance to high salinity for some crops. So the process for developing this kind of crop is, and these kind of varieties for a particular crop is, you need to identify what stages of the crop life cycle are stress um, impacted. So for many crops with heat stress, it is only a certain growth stage that is impacted by heat stress. We see this with broccoli, especially there is a, a stage of crop growth where um, if the plant is impacted by heat stress during that time, you will have quality problems. Um, if the plant is not impacted uh, by heat during that stage, then you will not have those quality problems. And that can make it challenging to uh, do the things you need to do later, which is select uh, material and germplasm that is resistant to that stress. It helps to understand the physiology of the stress tolerance so that you can um, target those genes um, 
understand what's going on, um, what sort of genetic mechanisms, how many genes are involved. Is it a complicated trait um, or a simple trait? Those, that's the kind of research that goes into um, the background of trying to develop these tolerant crops and then um, developing efficient screening methods so that you can select for tolerance efficiently. Then the breeders are going to have to use those screening methods to look at the diverse germplasm that's out there, perhaps wild uh, germplasm, wild relatives of the crop to see if there is in the gene pool the stress tolerance that the breeder is looking for, and then incorporate those screening and uh, selection techniques into the breeding program. Um, breeders are already um, have many uh, goals targeted usually. Uh, they have quality related goals. They have um, disease and yield uh, related goals. So adding stress tolerance to the, the breeding palette, I guess, um, is it's just an additional thing that breeders are um, trying to select for. And all of that uh, like adds to the cost of developing a variety. And um, we should, many of these adaptation strategies that uh, we're talking about, they, they are an added cost. So we should think of those as impacting our food system as far as increasing cost of production. Okay. so. There are some species of crops, and I'm, I'm showing lots of vegetables here because uh, that's what I work with, that are already heat tolerant. So we think of eggplants and sweet potatoes and black eyed peas as being incredibly heat tolerant. Um, I wanted to mention that black eyed peas were actually uh, really effectively selected for heat tolerance. And that is why they are very heat tolerant. There are some uh, heat uh, susceptible varieties. Um, some varieties of watermelon are actually fairly heat susceptible, even though we think of that as a fairly heat tolerant crop. And some of the research that I've done that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on bell peppers shows that they actually like to be shaded um, and benefit from less heat, even though we think of them as uh, a warm season crop. Okay, so we have done a lot of variety trials trying to identify varieties that have heat tolerance, um, greater heat tolerance than the varieties that are being grown um, as the standards in our area. And these are the crops that we have worked with and where we have identified varieties with additional, with greater heat tolerance. So lima beans, sweet corn, snap beans, tomatoes, cauliflower, broccoli, and lettuce are all crops where we have done a lot of trials and have identified heat tolerant varieties that growers can use. Okay, and I just wanted to show you some pictures of kind of what this looks like. So the top picture on the left is a lettuce trial. Lettuce, when it is exposed to heat stress, will bolt and go to flower, um, and it also becomes bitter. Anybody who's ever grown lettuce in their garden probably knows this. Um, so you will see in that photo that there are some lettuces, actually most of the lettuces that have turned into little miniature Christmas trees, but there are some sort of in the middle of that photo that have not bolted, and those are the heat tolerant varieties. Over on the right, there are some snap beans. Caprice is the variety that's pictured on the bottom. That is the variety that um, has been grown as a standard in the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, and on the top is PV857. What happens with snap beans when they're exposed to heat is that the pollen is damaged by heat stress. And so you get poor pollination, you get a lot of bent and crooked pods. So those end up in the coal pile. That's the far right pile in both of those pictures, and those are not marketable. So you'll see that for Caprice, the vast majority of the beans and the yield that's produced uh, is unmarketable. 
and low quality, whereas PV857 is a variety that does produce good uh, high quality beans under heat stress. And then um, those bottom two pictures are what happens to cauliflower uh, that is exposed to heat when it's not heat tolerant and nobody really, I don't think would pay for uh, that picture on the left. Um, so I, I just wanted to show you these pictures because it really does illustrate the impact of variety on heat tolerance for vegetables and how selecting heat tolerant varieties can save you from uh, quality disaster. And I want to note that it really is a lot of quality issues with vegetables and heat. Um, sometimes we don't necessarily see yield impacts. So Caprice might still make lots of beans, but they will be low quality. That cauliflower is still made ahead, but it's not marketable. Um, so it's a lot of quality issues with vegetables. All right. Another adaptation strategy that we have looked at is using shade cloth. This is really impactful for bell peppers is what we have found. Um, so in some trials that we did in 2018 and 2019, using 30% black shade cloth increased our marketable yield three times the yield of plants that weren't shaded um, and increased the percent of the yield that was marketable, um, which is really important because then growers are throwing away uh, fewer, fewer peppers. It is a picture of a lettuce trial that I did um, using shade cloth and uh, we found that shade cloth reduced the development of bitterness in lettuce compared to no shade and combining shade cloth with a heat tolerant variety was the most effective way to um, extend the lettuce season. We did find that, you know, this is not a perfect solution. Um, all of these things are kind of complicated. Like I said, it costs money and increased management. So some shade colors increased bolting. Um, there are not necessarily easy solutions to the climate impacts that we're seeing. Other adaptation strategies that we are recommending and that people are adopting for vegetables using particle films, which is like a spray on clay based um, product that shades the plant, trying to manage the soil and the field to improve drainage to help with our um, heavier rainfalls, so that's increasing organic matter through adding compost or using cover crops, tiling the field to increase drainage, leveling the field so you don't have ponding or um, ditching. The picture that you see to the right is a trial that Gordon Johnson is doing, looking at using white clover between uh, plastic rows as a cover crop. The idea here is especially for watermelons to keep the watermelons from touching the soil so that they do not get phytophthora capsaicea, that annoying disease that I mentioned earlier. And um, we have a host of increasing issues with soilborne pathogens, both uh, fungal, fungal-like and nematode. And um, we are doing a lot of work looking at biofumigation using a mustard cover crop to deal with some of those issues. And then on the fruit, I just wanted to mention that we are really seeing impacts many years from fall springs. And that is problematic in a perennial crop that is a huge event investment. Um, so when growers are putting in plantings, we are recommending that they plant varieties with diverse flowering times to try to avoid um, freezes to plan their operation so that they can um, use frost protection. And you really cannot put an orchard or a planting of fruit in any old location. You need to make sure that it is an area with air drainage so that you are less susceptible to freeze damage. There has been some regional work uh, trying to develop more stress tolerant varieties with um, some of the tree fruit, those, um, I would say that those are neglected areas as far as breeding. Um, and there is not a lot of funding to do work like that, that is also very costly. There's, there's an area there that could maybe use some attention. 
And then on the blueberry front, we have looked at using uh, some alternative varieties that might be more stress tolerant, especially um, to our increasing temperature summer conditions. So just to wrap up, what can you do? Jen mentioned it's really important to protect those um, carbon trapping areas. You can reduce your personal carbon footprint and you can talk about climate change and the impacts that it's having on your life and on the lives of people around you. Thank you, Emily. Here's our, here's our contact info for both of us. And if anybody has um, specific questions about uh, Jared and Amy's work, we can certainly pass them along to them if we're not able to answer them. But um, what kind of questions do we have? I know Jerry, so we have a couple in the chat. Yes, uh, we have a, one way back, and this I think is important from Danny. This is he's asking um, if rain is occurring in less desirable times, would not the development of more reservoirs help store water for when it's needed? So yeah, I think that's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it depends on where you live. So here in Delaware, we're, we're really kind of considered a water rich state. Um, we mentioned we have good groundwater reserves. Our Delaware Geological Survey has done uh, studies on our water supply and done projections with our population um, growth that they anticipate. And in um, below the canal, I believe all of our public water is coming from groundwater sources. Above the canal in Delaware, we do have reservoirs. And so it's very important to, to be looking about this and planning for it. Do you, do you have the amount of um, precipitation coming in where you can trap and capture that water? So in our area, I think we're probably in good shape. Um, I think we have what we need to get us through. Um, other places, though, that are much drier, definitely they should be thinking about that. Should they be building more reservoirs and um, keeping that water so that they can uh, store it and have it available during dry times? So it's a great question. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, uh, Emily, for both of your, your uh, comments. We have one other question in the chat. Um, and that has to do with the counterintuitive idea that black shade cloth provides better yield than white. And that's from Mary. Is there any comment on that? Yeah, sure. Well, the reason I um, tested different colors of shade cloth was because I was interested in answering that question. And I agreed that it's counterintuitive, um, especially on the peppers. Um, but I think part of it is that the, the shading impact of the black plastic, um, because the black shade cloth is, is basically absorbing and blocking the light from reaching the, the soil or the black plastic mulch that the peppers are growing on, that the, then that, um, that heat is not stored in the soil. Um, yeah. And we, I've really seen differences in soil temperature um, under the black uh, shade cloth that isn't so uh, pronounced under the other shade cloth colors. So, I think that's probably part of the reason why the black shade cloth is uh, better at keeping plants cool. Thank you. Thank you both. We're really to time. I'm going to share my screen as we finish up. And I'd like to really reiterate to everybody who's participating that um, both Emily and Jennifer are available for questions and comments. This is, this is merely, as we say, a taste or an appetizer. Um, could you also please look in the chat, everybody? We have a survey. We're really trying to make sure that we monitor people's interests and the, the speaking. So if you look in the chat, you'll see there's a link. If you could click on that link, that would be a way for us to make sure that we capture your comments. And then finally, I'd like to remind people that next week we have a, a, a discussion about grazing, food production, and the environment from Susan Gary. And that also will be a way for us to continue this conversation about the implications of um, climate change. So, I know we're right to time and it's lunchtime for people. If you have additional questions, please make sure that you send them to Jennifer and Emily. Um, any other thing that people would like to share? We can use the chat if you know of other meetings. Or Jerry, other is, it the, is it the case that the session is happening next week, even though it's a UD holiday? 
Ah, that's an excellent question. You know, I can't answer that. <laughs> I'm going to say yes, but I must admit that Maria is controlling the calendar. So that's a great question. I will send that to her. Um, please do check. There will be a reminder a daily, you know, as I as you get in the morning. Um, I'm not quite sure about the answer to that. Thank you, Karen, very much. Any other quick questions about this? Um, these are being recorded and the link will be sent to you where you can get to all the recordings. Uh, Jennifer, will the slides also be available? Yeah, I think Emily and I could uh, save them as a PDF and share them with you. That would be great. And again, thank you so much for giving us an overview. It's a lot to take in. And I know I'm sitting here going, oh my goodness, how can I help? <laughs> you know, we get visions of the Maryland of the Del Mar Peninsula suddenly becoming the best uh, windsurfing area in the Northeast. So we have to really take, take uh, seriously these global changes that are occurring. I think we're right to time. And again, thank you, Jennifer and Emily. It was very, very interesting. And certainly part of how are we going to develop new policies and practices for the Del Mar region.